so I was off for four months. Yeah, four months. And um, I also had a child that was a little bit older than a year. And so um, doing those talks actually, you know, brought me back to reality and talking with adults. It was nice because talking with a little older than a one-year-old was hard. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about sleep and fatigue. Um, I am going to start counting numbers on uh, who does fall asleep during my talk. So um, I was going to bring a, like a foghorn or something like that to wake you all up, but um, I might just go and shake you and wake you up. So we'll see how this goes. All right, so what are we going to cover today? We're going to talk about the differences between um, sleepiness and fatigue, some of the common sleep disorders in, in Parkinson's and their possible treatments. And um, I do on my little disclosure now is that um, anything that we talk about that um, uh, potentially is a treatment for maybe what you're experiencing, I may not be your doctor, so um, I, you have to talk with your doctor about that, right? Uh, what causes fatigue and Parkinson's and ways to reduce it? All right, so we're going to do a little background, and um, I was hoping to have my, my one screen up so you guys could see it on both sides, but I might have to um, do a little... Uh, yeah, octopus arms here. All right, so uh, the sleep-wake cycle. Um, so scientists have come up with this uh, two-process model for sleep, and this may explain why, you know, we have a siesta. Um, so as you see the top part, so we have the top part going here, yeah, and then there's the bottom part down there, okay, and then um, so here, and the black line in the middle, so the higher up past that, that line in the middle is, you know, how you are to be awake. And if you go down below that line, it's it, that you're going to become a little sleepy. So whenever, ooh, yeah, whenever we wake up, this, this alertness drive starts coming up and with peaks, and then it dips down right about there right after lunch. So <laughs> here we are. And then it does go back up and then dips back down whenever we're sleepy. And, you know, melatonin is uh, also a part of this circadian rhythm. And what it does is it is low when it's light out and dips down whenever it gets dark, right? Um, and then, so low up top, and then it dips down here. So I was going to draw that little line. And now <coughs> underneath is this other line, and this is our sleep drive. And as we wake up, we, feel ref we should feel refreshed. And as the day goes by, we get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier until we get the onset of sleep. And then it drives down. And there's a, a, a chemical in our brain, um, adenosine, that actually is driving this sleepy, sleepy, sleepy. And then whenever we fall asleep, it drops down, if that makes sense. So there is physiologic reasons why we have a siesta. That's, that's kind of sexy for a nap, okay? <laughs> All right, what is the difference between sleepiness and fatigue? And it can be pretty similar. So for sleepiness, about 50 to 75% of patients with Parkinson's can have this need in having the urge to sleep, okay? Um, and the longer you're awake, like I said, that adenosine kind of peaks up and then um, we get sleepier as the day goes by. <coughs> it is relieved with sleep compared to fatigue. Um, and there are some sleep disorders, and we'll talk about those that can uh, drive this sleepiness with it. And it can be a side effect of medications as well. So fatigue, about 40 to 60% of Parkinson's patients may have this. And this is a physiologic or a psychological feeling that you're, you're exhausted, you don't have any energy. Um, it does go undiagnosed a lot of times. Um, and sometimes we rack it up to just being older, but it is fatigue. Um, we may have low energy. Um, you may not be able to rest or take a nap when you're very fatigued. Um, and it is not relieved with sleep. So that's sort of the difference. <coughs> So you can have fatigue with sleepiness, but you may not have sleepiness with fatigue, if that makes sense. And then there are some people with fatigue that do not necessarily fall asleep whenever they're sitting and resting. Um, and then as uh, the severity of Parkinson's and the duration goes on, you may have more problems with sleepiness and fatigue, and then of course the medications can do that. All right, so more science here, right? Why things happen the way they do. So these are the sleep stages, and then we're going to go over some of the sleep disorders. So the sleep stages, this is a different graph than what we just had, um, and we start up top with, we go through cycles of sleep, okay? And then, like, 
first and second cycle, that might be like the first half and then the third and on, maybe the second half of sleep. And we start off with we're awake and then right below being awake, the lighter stage um, is REM, but you don't go sort of right into REM whenever you fall asleep. And then there's stage two, stage three, uh, stage one, stage two, and then three and four are your deeper stages of sleep. And the deeper stages of sleep are we do our physical recovery, and they are more, as you can see, the green boxes are pretty wide there in the first half of the, ni of the night. Um, that's where we get our physical recovery. And so it's more deep stages when we first fall asleep. And then the second, or sorry, the third, the fourth, and the fifth, we get more REM. So the REM, the blue boxes get wider and wider. And every now and then we have that peak, and that's when we wake up. Okay, so a lot of times when people wake up, they're like, oh, I remember having a dream, and that's probably because you were, you know, waking up around that area, right? If you wake up in this part, you may be paralyzed, and you might have that almost like sleep paralysis. All right, so REM behavioral sleep disorders. Um, all right, and one more thing, the REM is the REM sleep. That's when we do our mental recovery, and it helps with our memory and things like that, too. Okay, so REM behavioral sleep disorders. Um, this can be a premotor symptom to Parkinson's, and uh, it can happen about 10 to 20 years prior to the onset of the shuffling gates or the, the tremors. And it can range from kicking, talking, screaming. And sometimes I'll ask people <clears throat> if you've ever done that, and they say, well, I don't do it now, but I did it before. So sometimes it kind of fizzles out. Um, but about 50% of patients may have something like this, and it can be disruptive to the patient if they are punching walls or punching um, their partner. I've had people that describe, you know, they were a wrestler at one point and they, their partner now was a wrestler, you know, like a partner was also wrestling with them. Um, these dreams tend not to be the most pleasant of dreams. It's very rare when I hear that someone like giggles and talks like that. Um, usually you're being attacked or someone's, uh, you're defending something. Um, and the most beneficial medication uh, we use is clonazepam, and that is um, a medicine that's a cousin to Ativan or Valium, and it helps about 90% of the time. However, we may try melatonin first to see if we can regulate that sleep-wake a little bit better, um, and it, sometimes it, I'm pleasantly surprised when I hear that it works. Like I said, it also sort of can fizzle out too. And then we talk about doing environmental modification, so if there's a, um, a desk or a nightstand right next to you, we kind of tell you to move it around and, and kind of keep things safe. So this is where my other thing would be nice. So if we have this condition, this sleep line kind of squishes down. So it, the <laughs> yeah, I had some coffee this morning. So it goes right there, and then so you're peeking up in the, the dream state, and you're half awake, half asleep, right? So the line goes down, and it's like right there. So um, some people will say, oh, I'm hallucinating, and I'm seeing somebody when I wake up, I see somebody in the room with them. That's not really an, a, like a hallucination. It's more that you're not out of that dream state yet. But that's the reason for that. That wake cycle kind of squishes down to where that dream state is. All right, obstructive sleep apnea is another big one. About 20% of Parkinson's patients may have this. Um, and it does not matter about size um, for Parkinson's. It could be a, a very thin person with Parkinson's. In the general population, sometimes you have a bigger, thicker neck or you're a little bit more overweight. Is that? What? Well, that's kind of weird. Maybe we're all hallucinating. I don't, don't know how that happened. Um, yeah, I was like, in my eyes? Ugh. Because that was like half the last slide. Let's try to go back. Ooh, there's a circle there. I don't know if I can do that the rest of the time. IT. All right, while we're waiting for them to fix that, um, because that's going to make me dizzy. Um, so with sleep apnea, what happens is you snore, snore, snore throughout the night, and then there's an obstruction of your airway. And so the top picture is nice air passing through. And that, there, that could, see, it worked. And then the bottom is that, you know, this person's on their back, and the, the anatomy is kind of flopping down, and then it obstructs the airway. So people tend to snore, 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 and then they uh, stop breathing, and then the brain says, hey, I'm not breathing, let's wake up. And it wakes you up. And you may not realize that you're waking up all night long, but you, um, your body wakes up. And so the, the, the squiggly lines are actually the sleep study. And the blue square is where the B 
before the blue square, the patient has like electrodes on their, their chest and they're breathing and it's going up and down and then all of a sudden they stop breathing and then it goes flat. And a lot of times in this box, you can have desaturation of your oxygen level and that's what tends to wake your body up and then you start breathing again. So if you can imagine with our sleep uh, architecture, right? Um, so this is a couple slides next, but um, we are waking ourselves up with that, where that REM is in the second part, right? We have a lot more spikes. So sometimes people wake up and they're like, I swear I slept all night long. I had eight hours of sleep and they feel like they're not refreshed. So, all right. So, um, so when we are considering uh, sleep apnea, we may uh, get a sleep study. We may send you to a sleep specialist. Usually we tell you no alcohol within three hours of bedtime because that, um, decreases our respiratory drive, and then you may have more apneic episodes. We may say you have to do some weight loss. Sometimes people just have a thick anatomy here, and you might have to see ENT, and they may do some stuff like with devices with your jaw to kind of lift it forward, and they may recommend that you do a CPAP or BiPAP. Now, I can't tell you how many people don't want to do a sleep study because they're afraid they're going to get a CPAP or BiPAP. Now, what happens if you don't treat sleep apnea, and this is my little soapbox? Well, Sometimes we have problems with our blood pressure that no medications are helping, so it's refractory. We may have cardiac arrhythmias. We can have risk factor for stroke or heart attack. And remember, Parkinson's tends to be nice and, and progressive, but stroke and heart attacks, you're fine one minute, you're not the next. So that's my soapbox. Um, you can have problems with concentration and memory. You can get the daytime sleepiness. Uh, you might be talking to somebody and fall asleep in the middle of a conversation. You may have a hard time with losing weight. You're exercising and exercising, and you're watching your, your diet, but you can't lose weight. You can have sugar problems that are hard to control, cholesterol problems that are hard to control, erectile dysfunction, and then your mood may be worse during the day, and medications may not help. So I'm off my soapbox now. So it's important for us. All right, restless legs and periodic limb movements of sleep. Uh, restless legs can be familial. Um, it can be associated sometimes with iron deficiency anemia. Um, they can go together, restless legs and periodic movements to sleep. So restless legs is that uncomfortable sensation. It usually happens in your legs. It usually happens at night, and it's a creepy crawly or an ache or something, and you feel like you have to move your legs to make them feel better. The periodic limb movements of sleep are a little bit different, but they can go hand in hand. You're asleep and your legs are moving. And so this can disrupt our sleep architecture as well. So if we are questioning restless legs, a lot of times we will check iron and ferritin. There is a little bit of a, um, a correlation with low ferritin and the, the ability for us to, to really get a good benefit with these medications. Oh, well, I don't know what I just, there we go. All right, these are some treatments for restless legs. So for restless legs and periodic limbs of sleep. Um, so with restless legs, we may start with supplements. If you're iron deficient, we may give you iron. And some people will even need iron infusions. Um, magnesium um, can help as well. And that's a supplement that's over the counter. Um, sometimes we use dopaminergic medications and that can be any Parkinson medication. Now sometimes our medicines can make, it's called augmentation where um, you can get those symptoms starting off at night, and as time goes by, because of our medications, what we're giving you anyway, those symptoms can get earlier and earlier during the day. Um, and some people may notice they have them in their arms, too. Uh, we can use anticonvulsants like gabapentin um, and benzodiazepines like that clonazepam that we talk about. And last, we usually try the opiates or the narcotics, but because of everything that's happening in the news now, we try to stay away as much as possible. And the pharmacies and insurances are causing a big stink, even if we even bat an eye towards a narcotic. Periodic limb movements of sleep is usually best controlled with that clonazepam. All right, ways to reduce excessive daytime sleepiness. We can improve our sleep hygiene, and I'll talk about that. And some of this from here on out may sound repetitive, but I need to do it. Um, we need to look to see if there is an underlying cause. We may look at medications. We may say, hey, don't do so much alcohol at night, or, um, you know, um, alcohol during the day. We also may say, hey, you may not want to eat a turkey every day with that tryptophan, right? Um, because you're going to fall asleep during the day. And we may question using caffeine, but this is something that you need to talk with your, your physician about. All right. 
So the circadian sleep disorders, I do want to touch on this. I hear this a lot. And a lot of times it's habit that kind of makes this the way it is. And it's hard to break a habit. Um, so the top box is normal. And so that's roughly, let's say, 10 o'clock at night to like 6 a.m. in the morning. And that's just somewhat normal. Okay. And then the one below it is the uh, advanced sleep phase disorders, and the one below is delayed sleep phase disorders, and that box shifts forward. So this is actually, ooh, I keep doing that. This is nighttime, this is day, right? Night, day. All right, and so the advanced one, it just moves your normal to further up. Now I know that, you know, Denny's and places like that have that early bird special that make you eat earlier and then you go home and then you're tired early. Um, but this is, you know, people are falling asleep around seven o'clock and then they wake up around three o'clock in the morning and there's nothing on TV except for CSI and, and you know, um, all those shows that really, are, you know, you, you can't be addicted to. Um, and then there's the delayed sleep phase disorder and that's like the, the normal shifted that way. Um, and so, um, people with advanced sleep phase disorders are usually older people, and then the delayed tends to be um, college students that want to stay up all night. So, <laughs> all right, so this gets a little complicated because my, or my arrows. I found two slides and I liked them both, but they kind of didn't match up. So, if we're looking at treating uh, an advanced sleep phase disorder, so that's if you're moving this way. That bottom thing is how you, so it says you want to phase delay it. So that's trying to push it this way. So you could do morning melatonin and you can do light boxes in the evening. So if you have this bright, happy light, and then you may push your, your sleep off a little bit more. If you are where you're shifted that way, where you're going to bed around, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and then you can't get up until noon, you may want to do the evening melatonin around like say 10 o'clock, and then you wake up and you do your light boxes. All right, but this is what you need to go over with your physician, right? Um, treating insomnia. So these are like the difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep, and this is, you know, not what we want. Um, uh, so uh, sometimes, you know, during the day when people wake up, they may have the daytime sleepiness. They may feel kind of low with the fatigue or irritable or depressed. So things that prevent us from falling asleep, so we need to go through these to see, is this me? Um, do I lay down and do I have racing thoughts? Um, is, am I, you know, having a hard time getting comfortable? Do I have restless legs? Am I, is my Parkinson's meds wearing off at this time? Do I take too many naps during the day? Huh? That's all of us, right? We, t we doze and we watch the, the nine mind-numbing shows during the day and we don't keep active and then we keep taking naps and then we push our, you know. All right, we may watch TV or look at our iPad or iPhone, and those have blue lights that are stimulating, so that might make it hard to fall asleep. I've had people that I teased out that they like to watch horror movies right before they went to bed. That's racing thoughts. Um, um, and I also had someone who liked to watch, what was that show, Criminal Minds. Yeah, where there's someone like always trying to attack, you know, and kidnap and, and murder people. Don't watch those shows. You want to do boring shows. I always make the joke that you guys can have one of my neurology books. They're very, very boring. You want to do boring things. You don't want to read a novel that is so like, you know, you're just so into it. You want to read short stories that are not that interesting. Magazine articles. <laughs> No, I mean, some short stories are fun, right? I, you know, but you don't want to be like, I'm going to go to the next chapter and keep on going and see what happens to Brumhilda and the guy from, you know, the pool. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, and then staying asleep. So you need to think about, are, are my medications wearing off? Am I waking up with painful dystonia? Um, am I peeing all night long? Um, am I waking up because of sleep apnea? Do I have these REM behavioral sleep disorders? Um, and do I wake up and then do these other things and then I can't get back to bed because I'm having racing thoughts again? And then, so my red is how we potentially can treat this. Um, so, you know, with the racing thoughts, we may have to do mood medications. They may be Parkinson's meds. They may be the restless legs meds. If you take too many naps during the day, just don't do it. Set a timer, 30 to you know, 60 minutes at the max. Try to keep yourself stimulated. Exercise during the day. Keep yourself going. Um, watching TV and the iPads and stuff like that, just don't do it at nighttime. Boring stuff. Um, 
And then if we have bladder problems, you make sure you pee before you go to bed. And then you might need to talk to your doctor about some of those medications that potentially could help too. And if sleep apnea is, you know, the diagnosis, you need to treat that. All right, so sleeping agents. Um, there are these white noise machines that you can get. Um, they have phone apps now that you can play, and they have like, the, well, the one I have on my phone, it has like all these different ones that you can choose from, and the one is like a, a dryer with like, you know, like a, a button in there, and it's like this nice little rumble and hum, and you can set the time of how long you want it to play. Um, you could do meditation, you could do these eye masks. I say the eye masks are like someone giving you a little comfortable hug on your face whenever you're sleeping. It's amazing how much that works, because if there's any light coming through, this potentially could help as well. And I mean, they're, they're not harmful. Um, medicines. So this you really, really need to talk. There's a whole bunch of medications that you can potentially do, and some of them are over the counter, and some of them are, you know, you need uh, to have a prescription, but you need to talk about this with your doctor. So the ones I just want to touch on briefly, because there's so many of them, is you could do the melatonin. The one thing I do want to tell you, once again, about the melatonin is that there is this, what they call a negative feedback process with melatonin. So your brain, we already said, produces melatonin. And sooner or later, your brain and your body is, um, let's, let, not just you in general, but everybody's brain likes to be lazy. So if it starts seeing that it's, you're giving it what it's producing, sooner or later it's going to cut down on what it's naturally producing. So it may work for a while, and then it may dwindle off. And then sometimes you have to increase your dose at that time, or you have to do a drug holiday, and that sounds like you take more drugs, but you just take away, and then like maybe a week later, you can start right up back where you were. Um, so just remember that that happens, and because a lot of times people will come in and like it worked for a while, and then it stopped, so I stopped it, and then, but you can use it again. Um, the PM, so Tylenol PM, Advil PM, the PM parts are usually Benadryl. Uh, Benadryl is not a medication that is harmful for Parkinson's. It's what we call an anticholinergic. But this is a medicine that you, once again, if you're going to try to do it, you should probably talk with your doctor about it as well. Um, and like I said, there's a whole bunch of medications that can um, be prescribed for sleep. It, a lot of times it's depending on what our insurance covers, right? Um, but I do want to give you a little spiel on the Ambien or the Zolpidem. Um, it is, the short acting version is four hours. So people say, hey, I take it, I wake up four hours later and I'm wide awake because it's four hours long. They do have an eight hour long medication. Insurance does not like it. So sometimes you have to take it and then you wake up and you take it again. Um, the other thing it can cause is what they call parasomnias, and this happens in the, those deep stages of sleep three and four, um, where you can go sleepwalking, sleep talking, sleep eating, and sleep driving. Sleep driving is not always a good thing. <laughs> I've had two bad cases, one who um, woke up in the Wendy's drive-through, and one person who woke up at, uh, it was a shop at like a 7-Eleven, like they woke up in the parking lot there and he was going, I guess, for food. Um, or Slurpees, right? That's what 7-Eleven has. All right, so just be very, 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 very careful with that medication. We have a love-hate relationship with it. Um, sleep hygiene tips. So do go to bed regularly. Do wake up at a normal time, um, and you can set your alarm clock and do that on the weekends and the weekdays and do it all the time. Um, Try to relax before you go to bed an hour before. So once again, don't watch those horror films right before you go to bed. Um, and go and use your bedroom for sleep only. Um, so uh, take long naps during the day, no. Um, nap in the evening, no. And sometimes we can control this, but this is what we need to try not to do. Don't eat a heavy meal before bedtime. Don't drink caffeine or lots of fluids before bedtime because you're going to get up and pee all night long. And then, um, you know, this is something that um, if, if you are laying down and can't fall asleep, you may want to get up and do something that might mentally fatigue you where you're tired and then go back and lay down again. Because sometimes people... Um, get a little anxious whenever they can't sleep. And the other thing is, if you are a clock watcher, so if you're watching those digits go up and up and up, turn the clock around. You can still put that alarm on, just turn it around, because watching a clock and saying, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I need to get to sleep, 
is anxiety driving. So you're gonna get those racing thoughts and then your brain is not gonna shut off. So put a, put a towel on it, turn it around. You can keep it up there, but just don't look at it. All right, I do wanna touch on this very, very briefly. Um, I do have patients that like to treat their insomnia with alcohol. Um, and that, <laughs> uh, I know that, yeah, some people are going, I can't believe that, but um, they do. And uh, so it just really, really disrupts our uh, sleep architecture. So, um, and this is just my little graph because um, I want to show science here too. Um, so the black is that sh sleep architecture that we talked about. The blue is what alcohol does. It kind of goes, it, it works to get you to sleep right away, but it gets you down to those deep phases but you're not getting back up to where the REM is, so it really is disrupting what you're supposed to be doing. And then in the second half, you really don't go down to the deep stages and you're staying up higher on the, on the, um, the lighter stages. So it kind of does it, you know, where it's, it's your, your brain is an amazing thing. It, it has this thing that is set up that you're supposed to be doing, and it kind of disrupts that. The other thing is if you drink a lot of alcohol, what do you have to do 30 minutes later? Pee. So you're gonna be up all night peeing too. All right, and it also can be a suppressant for um, your respiratory drive, so you can have breathing issues as well. All right, problems with fatigue. Um, what am I supposed to be done here? Two? Two? 210, all right, okay, eight minutes. All right, I think I can do this. Fatigue, um, it's very common, um, and it may be, you know, people come in and that they have a lot of issues with this, and then the problem is it's not very well understood. Um, it is not diagnosed, and there, we don't really have any great treatments for it. So um, the thing that we have to um, think about is, you know, you may want to time out when you feel fatigued. I mean, I get it that the siesta time, people feel fatigued and tired then, but is it during the peaks of these doses of medications? Um, and some of our medications just potentially can make us feel tired and fatigued. We need to rule out other underlying causes, so the sleep disorders that we just went through. Do we have thyroid issues? Do we have anemia? Um, you know, some people have anemia and then they get short of breath and they get tired and physically fatigued when they're walking. Um, do we have depression? Do we have cardiac issues? Do we have an infection? How many people had the flu and then they, you know, they felt fatigued afterwards, right? That's just kind of coming along with it. Um, we need to make sure our sleep hygiene is fine-tuned. And we need to make sure that our Parkinson's meds are what we are. And that's why you talk to your doctors, right? And if you can time out where I feel off and I feel really tired during that time or really fatigued during that time, maybe we just need to spread your medicines a little bit more. Um, so you have to talk with your doctor. Um, and then if we have depression, we need to potentially be you know, treated for that um, or maybe seeing a urologist. All right. So um, there are a couple medications, um, if appropriate for you, that we sometimes we treat. Um, amantadine sometimes is acts as a neurostimulant. For people with traumatic brain injuries, they actually use this in rehab to get the brain like moving a little bit more. It is not like a Ritalin stimulant, um, but that's one of the reasons why we tell you to take it first thing in the morning and then maybe not after two o'clock because it can cause insomnia, so it can rev you up a little bit. Selegiline is an older medication. I don't know if anybody is on this or um, you know, was on it in the one point. When it breaks down, it breaks down to like speed. So sometimes we use it just to rev you up a little bit more. And we can use caffeine at appropriate times and once we get said not at bedtime, right? All right, so what can you do to reduce the fatigue? Exercise, exercise, exercise. Um, and you know, people say, hey, well, I haven't exercised in two years. I'm gonna start running, you know, the 5K again tomorrow. You do have to build up your endurance because you can get physically fatigued, right? You need to build it up. And, um, and it's just time has gone by for some people and you need to be realistic. Um, the best time of the day. So if you say, hey, when I'm on my medicines and they're working well, my mornings are better, then try to do most of your stuff in the mornings and maybe not whenever you're really, really, really tired. You can take breaks and don't put so much pressure on yourself to get everything done then. And you can, um, uh, you know, triage your work. Sometimes we don't like to do that, but you can tell people to help you out. Um, organization and clutter. 
Um, so if by chance you have a whole bunch of stuff around there, um, sometimes we get a little anxious with it, we um, get overwhelmed, and if we have things organized and decluttered, you may not be as fatigued. And that sounds weird, but it's true. Um, uh, keeping that regular sleep-wake cycle going, and then um, talk with your, your friends and family, and take short naps, not long naps. Um, try to reduce your stress, have fun, keep yourself mentally engaged with things, exercise again, and then you might need a change in your medications, but you have to talk with your doctor about that. All right, how can we reduce fatigue? Also, we can eat a well-balanced meal because nutrition also helps with energy. Um, you know, boredom also can lead to fatigue. Uh, so CSI and all those every day, the same, you know, I mean, it's kind of boring, so try to Try something new, keep yourself mentally active. You know, I have some people that came in and told me that they're playing the ukulele now, and I had one person who was in their 80s who started speaking Finnish, and they never wanted to go to Finland, which is really weird to me, but um, they were just trying to keep themselves going and keep their brains going. We need to hydrate and, you know, eat and make sure we're getting in a lot of nutrition and um, get some fiber going so we are not constipated too because sometimes when we're really, really constipated, we feel kind of blah, right? All right, and I might be three minutes early. <laughs> so I have three minutes worth of, uh, yeah. Any uh, interactions with uh, seasonal allergies like the pollen that's overwhelming you? Yeah, so I, I, I do think that sometimes the fatigue could be like seasonal, so it could be spring and fall, because um, whenever people can't breathe and they're, they're feeling that head pressure, when you have pain in general, you tend to be like, bleh, right? And that could be like a fatigue. So, and I know it's hard not to like go outside during the spring, and there's some, some cities that I've been to where you walk out and there's like a green hue on the ground, um, and you feel like you shouldn't be breathing the regular air too. So um, I do, I do think that, yeah. And then the medicines you use to treat the seasonal allergies make you tired and fatigued. Um, is there like something too, like sometimes still like you're sitting there, and you fall asleep because like the deep sleep, like you like you just kind of pushing over, you're just like you're done, you don't care. And then you wake up real alert. But I mean, it's so deep, like it's almost like narcolepsy. Yeah. Um, so sometimes, well. Yeah, so sometimes people do have narcolepsy, but um, the uh, if you're not getting into this with that sleep architecture, if you're sleeping at night and you're not getting down to those deep stages of sleep, then any time that you fall asleep, you may go right to it because um, it's trying to catch up during those daytime naps. Um, so as much as you can try to keep routine and regular, um, and I know that there are, you know, life happens, stress happens, we can't control that, things happen. You know, someone kicked you in the shin or hit your car, you're going to be up that night probably worrying about something or someone in your family is ill. So as much as you can t try to keep that routine, but sometimes when you don't get certain stages, you make it up right there. Any other questions? Am I fatigued? That's the next question you guys should ask. <laughs> yeah. All right. And... I probably only counted about 15. And the thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a righty, so I go this way, so I couldn't tell you how many over here fell asleep. I saw one, so, all right.